Well, thank you, thank you. I'm excited about this. Um, Ryan mentioned this is uh, a series we've been looking forward to, and um, when he told me it had to be the best sermon I ever preached in my entire life, uh, first of all, that's, that's some pressure. Uh, and so at first I was like, man, it's pretty cool. They're asking me to lead this thing off. That's awesome. And then I thought, maybe they just want to set the bar low for the other guys. <laughs> so I don't know if that's what's going on, but either way, I'm excited to be here this morning and uh, we're, we're going to have a good time, I think. So here's the way we're going to do this. It's going to be a little bit different this morning. Anybody ever seen a Quentin Tarantino movie? If you're raising your hand, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you maybe have seen one and you don't know, but Quentin Tarantino has a unique style when he directs a movie. He tends to do this thing where he'll show you the end and then he'll go back and he'll show you scenes from the story and kind of tie everything together and then he gets in and he plays the end again, but then it all makes sense, right? So that's how we're gonna do this thing this morning. I'm just gonna show you the end and then we're gonna go all the way back and I'm gonna give you scenes from this story that we're gonna look at because today we're gonna dive into a story of one of my favorite men from the Bible, somebody, and, and, and here's the reason why, okay? Here's why I love this story. I love this story because I think this is a story and there, there are things that we can take from any story in the Bible. There are things that we can pull, we can learn from. There are things that we can be taught through God's word no matter what story, no matter what uh, example it is in scripture. But this is a story that I think Every single one of us, it's just really clear what we can take from this because this is so applicable to each one of us. And so I love this story. You'll see what I mean. We're going to start at the end. We're going to go back. We're going to walk through it, and it'll all make sense, all right? I watched, a, uh, I watched a Tarantino movie, started to last night with my wife, Ashley. We made it about 15 minutes in, and she looked at me and went, do they just talk the whole time? I said, yeah, that's kind of what it is. So we shut it off and we turned on a different movie. Hopefully this is better for you than that. Otherwise, it will not be my best sermon ever, okay? So we'll see. And if you think this is awful, just email Ryan and tell him because I don't really want to read it. So, all right, here we go. End of the sermon. We're going to start at the end, go back, do the whole thing. All right, you ready? Here we go. First Peter. Peter writes this in First Peter chapter 5. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Now, we read a couple verses like that. There's some really cool stuff in there, but what I'm gonna try to do today is tell you a little bit of Peter's story, a little bit of his life that we read as we look through the Gospels that hopefully will help you understand those verses in a different way because you read a verse like that and you think, man, that's really cool, that's awesome. You know, God will restore me, he'll do all these things. There's all these promises in there. God cares for me, I cast my anxiety on him. It's all cool. But when you understand as Peter's sitting and he's writing this letter toward the end of his life and he writes these words on this page, there is so much meaning in those words because of what he had gone through that I think by the time we're done here in the next few minutes, it's gonna mean something entirely different for you. So that's where we're gonna go, all right? So let's go all the way back now. Let's start here. When you were a kid, what was your dream? Think about that for just a minute. When you were a kid, what was your dream? Because every kid has a dream, right? When I was a kid, I can remember one of my earliest dreams was I wanted to be a professional baseball player. That was my thing. I'm sure some of you in the room, you had the same dream when you were a kid. You wanted to be a pro baseball player. I grew up, I can remember when I was about 11, 12, 13 years old, watching the Indians in the World Series, blow it a couple years. Thanks, Jose Mesa, for that one. And, uh, and I remember watching those teams, and Omar Vizquel is my favorite player, and I just remember watching that thinking, I would love to be a baseball player. So we had these neighbors across the street, and their son-in-law actually pitched for the Indians in the 80s, and so his sons were about my age, his sons, Eric and Scotty, and I can remember every time they'd come to visit, we'd go in my grandma's backyard, my grandparents lived next door, we'd go back there and we'd play baseball and, and it was only a few of us from around town, but we would have such a good time. And I can remember Tom, Tom was Eric and Scotty's dad that played for the Indians. He would take us down the street to the baseball diamond and he'd throw fastballs at the backstop. And I've never seen something move that fast in my entire life. It was so cool. And I just had this passion for baseball. We'd, we'd set up this thing in the backyard where we'd have first base and second base. And we would just, for 
hours at a time, we just throw the baseball back and forth and pretend we were turning double plays, right? That we were the Indians and Jim Tomey's on first, and Omar's at short, we're, we're turning double plays and just having a good time. And I wanted to be a pro baseball player, but I just didn't have what it takes. Now, Scotty actually went on, Eric, Eric and Scotty both went on, they played baseball in college. Um, Eric had an injury and didn't make it any further than that, but Scotty played four years for Team USA. He was drafted by the Yankees, made it to the big leagues with the Marlins. He's still in the Phillies system now. And so he, he made it, but I didn't have what it took. So he just, he kind of passed me up, right? So the baseball dream didn't go anywhere. I had a dream for a while, I wanted to be a pro basketball player. But for a variety of reasons. One is I'm, I'm not very fast and I can't jump very high and I'm just not that good. So <laughs> playing pro basketball never worked for me, but I can remember in junior high, I played with a, a, a guy who went on and he played pro ball overseas and then he made it into the NBA D League and he just made it so much further, but that dream never worked out for me. I had a dream for a while that I just, I wanted to be a rock star. So I, I started a band, I had some friends in my band and now I look back and I like watch some videos and I listen to some things and it's pretty clear why we didn't make it very far. You know, my rock star career was short lived. Just didn't have what it takes. But one of the guys that was in one of those bands with me actually went on and he played in a touring band, traveled all over the world for like eight or nine years. And so I watched him, he went off and he lived the dream that I had. And I was like, man, that's what I wanted to do. That was my dream and he got to go do that. And so finally I wound up falling back on like my, my, my go-to, like kind of like last resort dream of being a youth pastor and you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, but you had, you had a dream too, right, when you were a kid. You had a dream too. So by now hopefully you're thinking of what that was. So Peter, who we're gonna meet in our story today, Peter had a dream when he was a kid. Just like every, every kid in Peter's neighborhood, every Jewish kid, when Peter was a child, every single Jewish boy had this dream. They all wanted to be a priest. Now, that might seem weird to you, kind of like, man, you grew up wanting to be a youth pastor. Um, that might seem weird. Who grows up wanting to be a priest? But Peter and every boy in his neighborhood, every, boy in his, in his, uh, every Jewish boy as a kid wanted to be a priest. That was the dream. And their whole culture was built on their educational system. And so they set it all up. All their schools were set up to lead kids in that direction. And so what would happen is about the time they were six years old, they would go to this school. It was called um, Bet uh, Safer. I'm not even sure if that's how you pronounce it, Bet Safer. But the idea was you go to this school and you memorize the whole Torah. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. By the time you're 10 years old, 10 years old, you have memorized the entire Torah. The first five books of the Bible, you know it by heart. That's what their educational system was set up to teach them. And so what would happen is when they turned 10, it was kind of like this first test where they, they maybe line all the kids up and they test them and they go through all this stuff. And the best ones, only the best ones, were then invited to move on to the next house. Okay, They were invited to move on. So that, that first house was called the house of the book. And they learned a part of the book. So when they became 10, if they had what it took, they went on and they moved on to the house of learning. And when they got to the house of learning, they would go and they would learn the entire Hebrew Old Testament. So if the first five books of the Bible weren't enough, by the time they were 14, they knew the entire Hebrew scripture. All the Old Testament, they had it memorized. That was the idea. And so they get to the age of 14, and again, they line up and they're tested, and these priests are coming in, and they're asking them these questions. And if they had the answers, if they had what it took, at 14 years old, if they, if they had what it took, then they were invited to move on to the next house. And in that house, they would begin to learn how to answer questions with questions. And so we see Jesus do this sometimes when he teaches. Somebody would ask him a question, and he didn't just answer him, he'd ask him a question back. That was actually part of what he learned as a young Jewish boy going through the educational system. And so they all, if they made it that far in the system, they would have learned this. It's, it's like this, somebody asks you what color is the sky, and instead of saying the sky is blue, you might say what color is your eyes. You'd answer a question with a question, that kind of thing, right? So in this other house, the other thing that they learn to do is they learn to interpret scripture. And what that means is they're looking at scripture, they're looking at all this stuff that they spent the, these eight years of their life learning, and now they're figuring out, okay, what does this mean, and how should I live because of what this means? That's where they're starting to reason through this logically, right? This part of their education. They're starting to figure this out. What's this mean, and how should I live because of what it means? And so from the age of 14 on, that's kind of what they do. And then they reach this point where it, this is where the dream kind of like the rubber hits the road, right? This is where things get real. They reach this point where the, every, every Jewish boy who had made it that far would go to a priest and he would say, hey, can I follow you? Can I follow you? And what they were asking is, can I 
walk with you? Can I learn from you? Can I watch you? Will you teach me how to do what you do? Can I learn to be a priest just like you? And so for a priest, when someone came to them, when one of these, these Jewish boys came to him and he said, hey, can I follow you? You had to ask yourself some questions like, does he have what it takes? Can he do what I do? Because if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna allow him to follow me, then I wanna make sure he's got what it takes. And so his answer would be one of two things. His answer would either be, yes, you can follow me. Come on, and I'll teach you, and you can walk with me, and you'll learn, and you'll, you'll understand how to do what I do. Or they would get this answer. The priest would say, no, you don't have what it takes. Go learn your family trade. See, from the age to, for, uh, of six to 10, when boys were learning the Torah, if they got to age 10 and they didn't have what it takes, the priest would say, go learn your family trade. At the age of 14, if they didn't have what it takes, the priest would say, go learn your family trade. After this final book, uh, the final uh, schooling period, whatever that age that came to, depending on how quickly the student progressed through, if they didn't have what it takes, the priest would say, hey, go learn your family trade. So your family's a carpenter, your dad's a carpenter, go learn to be a carpenter. Your dad's a fisherman, go learn to be a fisherman. Your dad makes tents, go learn to make tents. Your dad's a doctor, go learn to be a doctor. Whatever it is, go off and learn your family trade. Only the best of the best of the best were invited to come and follow a priest. And very, very rarely, only occasionally, this wasn't like a normal thing, right? Only occasionally, on very, very rare uh, circumstances, would a priest actually see such potential in a student that he wouldn't even wait for that student to come and say, hey, can I follow you? Very rarely, the priest would actually go to that student and would say, come and follow me. And that was like the dream, right? Imagine that, imagine that you, you know, your dream is to be a pro baseball player when you're a kid and one day the phone rings and it's the GM of your favorite team and they say, hey, we want you to come play for us. Like, that's the feeling that you had as a Jewish boy uh, when, when you were growing up. If a priest said, come and follow me, I think you have what it takes. You can learn to live the way that I live. That was very rare. And so you gotta understand that context. That sets the whole thing up, right? That's what Peter grew up with. Now, let's dive into Luke chapter five. That's, that's the first scene in our Tarantino thing, right? That's the first scene. Peter's childhood, that's how he grew up. Here's Luke chapter five. End scene, scene number two. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. In the book of Matthew, that same story is told. Jesus shows up. And he sees Peter fishing. So first of all, what's that tell us about Peter? He didn't have what it took. At some point in his childhood, somebody looked at him and they said, you don't have what it takes. Go learn your family trade. And his family were fishermen, and so here we are, years and years later, and we find Peter with his friends on a boat fishing. And in the back of his mind, maybe every day when he wakes up and he gets out of bed, Peter thinks, oh man, if only I had what it took. If only I had what it took. So one day he's out on the lake. It's been a rough day. He hasn't caught anything. And Jesus shows up. He says, let down your nets. And so he lets them down and they catch all these fish. And so there's obviously something different about this guy. Jesus has been teaching. Maybe Peter's been hearing him in the background. He's been listening to this guy teach. Peter understands this guy, Jesus, he is a religious leader. He sounds just like a priest. In fact, they call him rabbi. That was a term for priest. He sounds just like one. And so this guy must know what he's talking about. Then all of a sudden, Jesus just climbs into his boat. And Peter's like, this is weird. And Jesus says, let's go out on the lake. And so he takes him out on the lake and he listens to him teach and he's impressed with him. And then the fish thing happens. And then Jesus looks at him and he says this. He says, Peter, follow me. And for Peter, this is like a dream come true. 
He's waited his entire life to hear those words. Peter, follow me. And so when you read this, and maybe you've read that story before, maybe you've heard this before about how Jesus goes out and he calls his disciples and he says, come follow me, and they drop everything. And, and maybe you've thought, man, why would, why would somebody just leave their livelihood, leave everything behind? Why would they do that to follow some guy they don't know? You've got to understand, it's because they have waited their entire lives to hear these words. This isn't just somebody showed up one day and said, hey, come with me. This is Peter has lived his whole life wishing someone had said that to him, and now here's this day that this guy shows up and he says, hey, come, follow me. I think you have what it takes. I think you can do something special. So for three years, they follow him, they watch him, they learn from him, they listen to him, teach, they're observing, they're learning how to do what he does. Peter and these 11 other guys, the 12 disciples, Jesus says to each of them, hey, come, follow me, let's go. And they are living the dream, and then this happens, right? Fast forward a little bit. This is the next scene in our story. This is what we see, uh, this interaction between Jesus and Peter. And Jesus is asking the disciples, who do you say I am? Because there's all these rumors starting to float about Jesus, about who he might be, and people around town are talking. There's this buzz going on because Jesus is healing people. He's teaching, he's doing all these miracles. And so some people say he's this, and some people say he's, you know, he's Moses or Abraham or John the Baptist come back and whatever else. And so Jesus sits down with his guys and he says, guys, I need to know this. We gotta make sure we're all on the same page here. Who do you say I am? And a couple of them respond, well, they say you're this, and those people say you're this, and they say you're this. And this is what Jesus says to Peter. And he says, well, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. In other words, nobody else gets this but you. Obviously, God's let you in on something here. And so he says, I tell you that you are Peter. This is where, so Peter's birth name was Simon. He wasn't born with the name Peter, right? And Peter, when you translate it, it's also Cephas in the scriptures, but when you translate it to English, it means rock. And so Jesus says, I tell you, you're not Simon anymore. Now you're Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And so now put yourself again in Peter's frame of mind. You've waited your whole life to have somebody show up and say, hey, come follow me. And now this guy says, Peter, you are the rock. All this stuff I'm doing, all this momentum that's building, all these good things that are happening, it's me launching my church, and you're the rock that I'm gonna use to launch my church. Peter, you are the man. You have what it takes. To Peter, this is like, you have what it takes. He loves this. This is, this is good news. And so it's safe to say that things are going pretty well, right? If you're Peter, your life has taken a pretty crazy turn and things are going pretty well. So end scene, that's a quick scene, right? Fast forward, fast forward. One night, Jesus and his disciples are around the dinner table and they're eating together. Uh, and they've done this before. They do this all the time. They eat together all the time. They hang out all the time. So this is, it's dinner, right? It's part of the Passover festival. It's like a Jewish tradition. They do this every single year. And so they've been following for three years. They've done this before. They sat around this table, but this time Jesus starts to get a little bit weird. He starts saying some, some pretty cryptic things, some pretty, uh, pretty weird things to his followers. He starts making all these weird statements about temples being torn down and rebuilt and they're gonna do this and this is gonna happen and I'm going away and I'm coming back. All this stuff starts to happen. And his disciples are sitting around the table and they start to, to mutter to each other, do you have any idea what Jesus is talking about? No, I've never, he's been, he said some weird things but he's never said anything this weird. Do you know what's going on? I don't know what's happening right now. Like they're having this conversation trying to figure this out. And then they get toward the end of the meal and Jesus says this, Jesus told them, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. Peter replied, even if I'll fall away on account of you, I never will. What's happened just before this is Jesus uh, called out Judas. Judas is one of the 12 disciples. He says, Judas, you're gonna betray me. And he tells these guys, I'm gonna be arrested. I'm gonna be tried. They're gonna find me guilty and I'm gonna be killed. And then he says, all of you, you're gonna walk away. You're not gonna stand by me. And Peter says, no way, no way. I will not leave you, Jesus. I am in, I am all in, I have followed you this long, I am not gonna stop following you now. And Jesus uh, goes on and he says this. He says, truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. 
But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, even if it costs me my life, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And so now you're Peter, and if you're, if you're in his shoes in this moment, there's even like this tinge of, like this is offensive to you. There's a part of you that's going, Jesus, you showed up, nobody knew, like I didn't know who you were, you told me to follow you, I left everything and followed you. What, what would cause you to say that after everything I've given up to follow you, that you would, you would think that I would desert you now in this moment? If you're Peter, there's like this, this feeling of like betrayal on Jesus' part, like he thinks that you don't have what it takes to hang with him through this stuff. And so Peter says, Jesus, even if it costs me my life, I'm still in, I'm still in this with you. But Jesus says, Peter, you don't understand. Tonight, before the rooster crows, you're gonna disown me three times. And so fast forward a few hours. Jesus has been arrested. He's on trial now and he's being questioned. He's being mocked. He's being uh, beat and spit at. He's being cursed and condemned. And the scene begins to unfold in the courtyard where we're gonna pick up Peter's story now. And he's got all this stuff going on in his, his head. Just a, a few minutes ago, he was with Jesus in this garden and he fell asleep and, and um, they woke up to the sound of soldiers coming through the garden and they, they grabbed Jesus and they arrest him. And Peter, um, Peter says, no, it's not gonna go down like this. And so he draws his sword and he, he uh, cuts off the ear of one of the soldiers. He goes to battle for Jesus because in the back of his mind, he's thinking, no, Jesus said, I'm gonna fall away. I'm not falling away. I'll kill all these guys myself if I have to. Jesus told him, Peter, calm down. And you could read that whole story. We're not going into that. But now, a few hours later, it's been this crazy night. And Peter finds himself in the courtyard outside the high priest's house. And this is what happens as we pick the story back up in Luke chapter 22. Seizing him, Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. So it's, it's dim, you can almost picture it like a scene in a movie, right? And they're sitting out in this courtyard, there's these people milling about, but it's this kind of nervous tension as people are trying to find out what's going on inside there and they see Jesus, they've heard of this guy, some of them have met him, some of them have probably been healed by him. And now he's in there talking to the high priest and this can't be good because everybody knows the religious leaders have it out for him. And Peter's close, but not too close. And so this fire's lit and he's keeping his head down, hoping that it doesn't light up his face. They figure out who he is. And this girl notices him sitting there. She looked closely at him and she said, this man was with him. I saw him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. And about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him for eat. He is a Galilean. And they had an accent, right? They were like, he sounds just like Jesus. He must have been with Jesus. Look, listen to how he talks. Listen to how he talks. He, he's obviously been with Jesus. He's a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. <laughs> this is, whew. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Put yourself in his shoes. Peter, tonight you're gonna fall away. No. Even if it costs my life. Nope, I'm in. And then he denies him, and then the rooster crows, and then from inside the house, maybe through a window, maybe through a doorway, whatever it is, here's Peter outside and he looks up and there is Jesus staring straight at him. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Now, I told you earlier, that I love this story because there is something in here that every single one of us can relate to. And we're almost to that part, but you've gotta understand where Peter is right now. In his mind, this is the greatest failure that he could ever experience. Because not only has he betrayed this, this leader who said, follow me, he's betrayed one of his best friends, denied him, and even in that moment, he looks up and there he is and they make eye contact. 
And he just feels like a complete, utter failure. They try Jesus, they, they crucify him, they bury him. Three days go by, I'm fast forwarding through a lot of the story here, right? Three days go by, Jesus raises from the dead, just like he said he would. And so off and on over the next few weeks as Jesus has come back and now he's like, he pops up here, he shows up there, he hangs out with these people, um, he's over there one day and then he's with them. And, and Peter and the disciples, they've just kind of like gone back to their regular life because everything just, this whirlwind, like everything changed. And so Peter for three years, he lived the dream, but then he, he, he bombed. He flunked out and he didn't have what it took. And so in John chapter 21, at the end of the book, he finds himself right where he started, back on a boat. And this is what happens. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Peter told them, and so they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you caught any fish? Does this sound familiar? Same thing that happened the day they met Jesus, right? They're in a boat, they fish all night, they catch nothing, Jesus shows up, they don't know it's him. He says, hey, did you catch anything? Nope. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Sounds familiar, right? Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. We've been here before. We've seen this before. He's done this before. It's gotta be him. I know he's a long way away. I can't really, I can't, I don't recognize. It's got to be him. We've been in this place before, just like it happened the first time. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and he jumped into the water. Nothing was gonna keep him away from Jesus in this moment. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back in the boat and he dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many fish, the net was not torn. This is something different from the first time, right? Remember the first time early on in the book of Luke when they catch all the fish, what's it say about their nets? They started to break. And this time, Jesus holds them together. Even with so many, the net wasn't torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast, and none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was him. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time he appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Maybe he's pointing to the other apostles. Do you love me more than these guys? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, third time. This is a subtle, not so subtle thing Jesus does here, right? How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. This is subtle, but not so subtle. Peter picks up on the hint. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And now he gets weird again. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger and dressed yourself, you went where you wanted, but when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not wanna go. What he's doing here is he is literally laying out for Peter the way he would die. Years and years later, Peter died. He, he was crucified, just like Jesus. They stretched his hands out. It's like he says in that verse. And he was crucified, but he didn't feel worthy to be killed in the same manner as Jesus, so they actually crucified him upside down. But Jesus lays it out. He says, Peter, I'm gonna tell you exactly how this is gonna go. So maybe the first time I said, come, you'll fish for men from now on. When I met you three years ago, that's what I said. Maybe I wasn't clear enough. I was a little vague, so I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. This time I'm gonna be crystal clear. Here is what's in store for you. You know the stakes, and check this out. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God, and then he said to him, follow me.
I can't imagine what was going through Peter's mind at this moment. It's like life's a roller coaster these last few weeks, right? Everything's good, complete failure, finds himself rock bottom, and then Jesus shows up and he says, Peter, I still think you have what it takes. Follow me, follow me. Fast forward a few weeks in the book of Acts chapter two. And I love this because we see the turn that happens in Peter's life. It's the Feast of Pentecost. All these people from all over the world are gathered in the city and uh, people who speak all these different languages, all these different cultures, they're all together. Some Jewish people, but it's a lot of Gentiles. That's anybody who wasn't Jewish. All these people from all over the place all get together for this, this, uh, this ceremonial uh, event in the city. Peter, this time, instead of denying Jesus and instead of being ashamed, he gets up and he starts to preach. He says, let me tell you about Jesus. So many of you, you've been waiting for so long for the Messiah to come. He did come, you killed him. You put him on the cross. He raised from the dead. And so let me tell you how this goes. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and all your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So here's the contrast in Peter's life. One minute he's ashamed and he's denying Jesus. Jesus shows up and he says, Peter, you still have what it takes. Remember, you're the rock. My purpose for you is still the same. Yeah, you failed. Yeah, by some, t by some standards, maybe you're disqualified now, but Jesus says, not by my standards. My call for you, my purpose for you, it's all still the same. Peter, follow me, and I am gonna do some crazy things through you in your life, and you're still the rock I'm gonna build my church on. And now look, here he is, he stands up, he preaches to a bunch of strangers, and you know what's crazy? In the courtyard a few weeks before, remember when they were saying, hey, he was with Jesus, hey, he was with Jesus, hey, he's one of them, and what did they say? He's a Galilean, he sounds just like him. You know what happens in Acts? They hear these guys teaching, they hear Peter teaching, and they say, sounds just like him. At one point, they say these uneducated men, they knew, he's a fisherman. Listen to him teach. He sounds just like him. He must have been with Jesus. So let's wrap this up, all right? Here's why I love this story. I love this story because all of us can relate to this because in some way we've all failed. You had a dream, it didn't work. Or maybe you had a dream and it worked, but you screwed it up. And in some way you failed. And in those moments, especially especially if your moment of failure was that you failed Jesus. And you're at rock bottom and, you're, and, and some of you, you, you understand what I mean when I say that. Like you have this moment where you go, why would God ever wanna hear from me again? What he would say to you in that moment is, my purpose for you is still the same. My call for you is still the same. You still have what it takes. I still love you. You are not turned away. You're not disqualified. You're not rejected. I will restore you and make you new. Come, follow me. So with that in mind, let me go all the way back. First Peter chapter five, now read these words. Now that you understand Peter's story, he writes this. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, looking for someone whose dreams he can just rip apart. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You think you got it bad? 
whole lot of people understand because they're going through it too. And then he says this, and the God of all grace, if anybody understands grace, it's Peter. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he called you, he said, follow me. After you've suffered a little while, you felt like a failure, you felt like you blew it, after you've, you've lived in that for a little while, he will himself restore you and make you strong and firm, steadfast. So when Peter writes these words, he's looking back on a lifetime of experiencing this. He's looking back on a lifetime of moments where he felt like, man, I am a failure. But time after time after time after time, Jesus said, I have purpose for you. Come and follow me. And so there's three takeaways we take from this, and we're gonna, we're gonna end with this. The first one is God cares for you. You need to know that. You need to know that whether you're in a moment right now of failure in your life where you feel you're, you're listening to this this morning, you're like, yeah, that's me. You need to know that God cares for you. And there is no amount of failure, there is no uh, act you can do that disqualifies you from that. There's nothing that can happen in your life that can ever make God stop caring about you and you gotta know that. You have to know that's true. God cares for you. And so just like Peter says in these verses, you can take all that anxiety, take all that pain, take all that shame and cast it on him. He'll take it because he cares for you. The second thing is this. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, whether you feel like you, you, you knew what it was and you blew it, he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And just like he said to Peter, he would say to you, hey, if you will follow me, if you will trust me, if you will let me do this, I will do some crazy things in your life. I wanna use you to do some crazy things you can't even imagine. And you might think you don't have what it takes, but just like Peter stood up in front of a bunch of strangers and, and literally a movement took root in that moment that spread and is still spreading today. 2,000 years later, Jesus would say to you, I have a purpose for your life. Step into it, follow me. He has a plan for you, he has a purpose for you. And the third thing is that he offers you grace and restoration. Because one thing that's true is there is not a person on the planet who hasn't failed. It's not true. So even in those moments of failure, he offers you grace and restoration and he started that work on the cross. He started that work on the cross that same night that Peter experienced his greatest failure, his greatest moment of devastation. Hours later, Jesus went to the cross and he, he paid not just for that, but for every failure you and I have had, everyone we ever will have. And even in those moments, he says, hey, what I have for you is grace. And so now as we go into this time of communion, that's what we look back on. It's that whole story, it's, it's Peter's story, it's your story, it's my story, it's failure, it's grace, it's restoration, it's failure, it's grace, it's restoration, it's, it's grace and restoration for every failure because he cares for you. And he says, I have purpose, I have a plan. So now for just a couple minutes, we're just gonna say thank you. We do this every Sunday uh, just as a way of remembering his sacrifice for us and, and just as a way of uh, expressing our gratitude to him because of that grace and because of the restoration and the healing he offers. So we're gonna give you just a minute as, as servers, you can go ahead and come forward, begin to pass those trays. Uh, and as they do, as they pass the trays, we're gonna give you just a minute to take uh, the juice, to take the bread. Um, you can do that whenever you want here during this time and just take this moment um, to reflect on that stuff and to reflect on um, what he has to say to you, to reflect on that purpose and what that looks like in your life. And some of you this morning, for you that looks like you just need to step into it. And if that's the case, then um, come and talk to me or, or talk to Ryan or, or somebody else and, and you just need to, for the first time, you need to follow Jesus. But I just wanna pray for you real quick and then we'll let you 
I'll let you take communion when you're ready. God, thank you so much for your purpose. Thank you for your plan. Um, thank you for the plan that redeems us in our moments of failure and, and um, redeems our disqualification and our uh, lack of having what it takes on our own and gives us purpose that's greater than what we ever could have had without you. Um, God, I'm grateful for stories like Peter's that give hope to somebody like me who I can look at that and I can say, um, you have purpose for me too. And I pray that uh, those in this room this morning would feel that as well. Uh, thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for us on the cross. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your call to follow you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name.